In this part of the Instrumentation Lab series, you will be using gas chromatography to separate and identify three components in an unknown mixture. This presentation will introduce you to the basics of gas chromatography. First, we will review the general idea of chromatography, which you became familiar with when we studied thin layer chromatography. Just as in TLC, the components of your mixture will be in equilibrium between a stationary phase and a mobile phase. In TLC, the stationary phase was a solid phase, the TLC plate, and the mobile phase was a liquid, the solvent. However, in gas chromatography, the stationary phase is a non-volatile liquid contained within a small column, and the mobile phase is an unreactive gas passing through the column. The components of the mixture are carried through the column by this carrier gas. In the diagram below, the green and red colored dots represent two different types of molecules being partitioned through gas chromatography. The blue rings represent the liquid or stationary phase contained within the column. Watch as the molecules are being carried through the column with the carrier gas. Note how the green molecules are exiting the column before the red molecules. The red molecules represent molecules that have higher boiling points and spend less time in the gas phase. They therefore have an increased interaction with the stationary phase and move through the column more slowly. Shown here is a brief history of gas chromatography. The technique has been in use since the 1950s and has evolved from rudimentary packed columns to very sophisticated capillary columns. As you can see, gas chromatography has gained widespread use and is found in a variety of fields including chemical research, forensics, and the pharmaceutical industry. The cost of the instruments varies widely depending on sensitivity. For example, our student grade gas chromatographs cost about $4,500. We once bought gas chromatographs that cost $1,500 and subsequently used them as doorstops in the instrument room. So you do get what you pay for in the gas chromatography world. Gas chromatography goes by several other names as well. These names all refer to the same process, so don't get confused by the different terms, but become familiar with them as they could be on your gas chromatography quiz. Think for a moment about distillation, the other technique we have used to purify liquids in a mixture. By comparison, you can see some of the advantages of using gas chromatography rather than distillation to separate mixtures. Gas chromatography is much faster, minutes, compared to the two to three hours we took to do our distillation. And small sample sizes can be used, 0.5 microliters, versus 0.5 milliliters for the smallest microscale distillation. Gas chromatography is also one of the less expensive analytical techniques. There are, however, some limitations to this technique. Your sample must be vaporized to pass through the column, and there are upper limits to the temperature that these columns can withstand. So only relatively volatile samples can be used. Also, compounds must not decompose when vaporized. All gas chromatographs contain the same four basic parts. First, you need a gas to push the sample through the column. Inert gases are used because they will not react with the sample. Second, you need a place and a way to introduce your sample into the instrument. Third, you need a column where partitioning can take place between the gas and liquid phases. Last, you need a way to detect your components once they have been separated and leave the column. This is a diagram of a gas chromatograph. Note that several components of the instrument are heated. They really are hot. Be careful not to touch them when you go into the instrument room. To begin the process, the sample is injected into the instrument using a syringe. Once the sample is volatilized in the heated injection port, it is mixed with the carrier gas and moves into the column. 
The sample size is typically very small, less than one microliter for liquids. We will be injecting about a half a microliter using a one microliter syringe. This amount is so small that if you apply it to your fingernail, you can't even see it. It is important that you inject the sample smoothly and all at once. If you inject too slowly, the peaks are broad and poorly defined, like the first set of peaks. You want your peaks to look like the second set of peaks, sharp and clearly differentiated. Peaks can also exhibit tailing, such as the third peak. This occurs when you inject too much material, causing the sample to spread out in the column. Finally, if you stutter during the injection, you are effectively double injecting and will get extra peaks. The last diagram illustrates this effect. An integral part of the instrument is the carrier gas, which is typically helium, nitrogen, or argon. Do you remember its purpose? If not, back up and review the earlier slides. Once vaporized, the sample enters the heated column, where the components in the sample equilibrate between the liquid and vapor phases. Other than the preparative columns, which are used to separate large samples, there are two types of columns in common use. The conventional or packed column is an older style column. Capillary columns give much better separation and are found in most higher end instruments. This slide shows the difference in separation between the two types of columns. Note that the packed column leads to broader overlapping peaks. Two compounds that elute close together may be mistaken for a single compound and appear as one broad peak. The capillary column has resolved the mixture into many more clearly defined components. A packed column consists of tiny solid particles with a thin coating of the liquid phase packed into a small diameter tube. Here you can see a cross-section of a packed column. The column material appears to fill the entire interior column space, but in actuality it is not packed solid. An analogy would be a jar filled with sand. To your eye, there does not appear to be any space between the sand particles. However, there are gaps, and this is easily seen if you pour water over the sand and watch the water percolate through the sand. Gas can move through the packed material in the same manner, bringing the components of your mixture through the tiny spaces. These are the least expensive columns. The number of theoretical plates is fairly small, usually less than 8,000. Here is a picture of a typical packed column. It is looped because stretched out it would be too long to fit into the instrument. Think about your small intestine. Unwound, it would be more than 20 feet long. A capillary column consists of a thin film of the liquid phase coated onto the inside wall of a very small diameter glass tube. Here you see the cross section of a capillary column. This column is more like a straw, and the components of the mixture contact the liquid phase on the walls as the gas moves through the center of the column. These columns are typically very long and have many more theoretical plates, greater than a hundred thousand. Columns of this length must be wound many times in order to fit into the instrument. The metal support keeps the thin glass of the column from being crushed or broken. Here are some real capillary columns. As the components elute from the column, their presence must be detected in order for us to get any useful information. This is done by the detector, which is located at the end of the column. There are two common detector types. The thermal conductivity detector is the type found on our instruments. We will also talk a little about the flame ionization detector. This slide outlines the specifics of a thermal conductivity detector, or TCD. In essence, a TCD uses changes in electrical resistance to detect when a component exits the column. 
The sample is not destroyed when using a TCD. This diagram illustrates this process. The red dots represent the molecules of carrier gas. The blue triangles are molecules of a compound carried by the carrier gas. In the diagram on the right, compound molecules are coming in contact with the heated filament and changing its resistance. A flame ionization detector, or FID, is more sensitive than a TCD, but destroys the sample since it uses a flame to convert the molecules into detectable ions. These detectors are more expensive and are not used in any of our instruments. The detector sends a signal to a recorder, which generates a chromatogram, the graph. Ideally, each component that elutes should result in its own peak. This slide shows a chromatogram for a three-component mixture. You will not see the air peak using our instruments, as they are not sensitive enough to pick up the small amount of air injected with the sample. You can see that the peaks are well-defined and exhibit no tailing. The retention time is a measure of the time it takes a component to travel through the column and is measured from the time of injection to the middle of a particular peak. By comparing the retention times of known compounds to your unknown, you can identify the components in a mixture. Here is a summary of the principles of separation. If you need to look at it in more detail, you can go back and review the pertinent sections. The column type is integral to separation. You need to make sure you choose a column appropriate to your sample. In fact, there are companies that will custom design columns for particular applications. You also need to pay attention to your injection technique to ensure optimal peak differentiation. Lastly, remember that the separation is due to effective partitioning between phases. Now let's discuss the factors that affect the separation of a mixture in gas chromatography. First, just as in distillation, the difference in boiling points between your components will dictate how well they separate within a given column. Second, the oven temperature is important. We have set the temperature of our instruments to optimize the resolution of your samples. Please do not adjust these temperature settings. For your experiment to work, the retention times must be consistent, and different oven temperatures will cause different retention times. Recall that the retention time is a function of the vapor pressure of your compound. A higher temperature will increase the vapor pressure of your components, thus shortening the retention time. Third, you do not want to change the flow rate of the carrier gas. Increasing the flow rate will decrease the retention times, and vice versa. Fourth, you want a liquid phase in which your compounds can dissolve slightly, but will not get permanently retained. This ties into an appropriate column choice. Finally, the length of the column is important. Similar compounds require longer columns, more theoretical plates, but you don't want a column so long that it takes forever for the components to elute. As you can see, there are many common uses of gas chromatography. In the experiment you are going to perform, you will inject a mixture of three unknown compounds, you will be separating the components of this mixture and identifying what those components are. Keep in mind that ideally with a three component mixture you would like to see three different peaks. However, due to poor resolution you may see only two peaks, one larger than the other due to overlap. Using gas chromatography to unequivocally identify compounds has its limitations and is useful only when the compound's identity is limited to a small set of standards. On a similar note, one peak does not definitively tell you that you have a pure compound. However, seeing more than one peak is definite proof of impurity. A third common use of gas chromatography is to determine the relative amounts of components in a mixture. 
This is accomplished by measuring the area under each peak. You can do this mathematically by the triangulation method as shown on the slide. Alternatively, you can simply cut out and weigh each peak on an analytical balance. Using this method, the mass of each peak directly correlates to each component's relative quantity. This concludes the online GC lecture. In class, you will be taught how to use our specific instruments, as well as more details about the actual experiment. Keep in mind that you will not be allowed to start the experiment without a completed pre-lab and a passing grade on the gas chromatography quiz.